Planet Earth is under threat. Thousands of wild animals are in danger of becoming extinct. CBBC has decided to find out what's being done to save them. Last year, CBBC launched a nationwide search to find a group of children who care passionately about wildlife. Their prize, a trip of a lifetime to some of the planet's most remote and exciting places to look at the plight of some of the world's most vulnerable animals. <laughs> wildlife presenter Michaela Strachan was on hand to put the finalists through their paces. I'd love to do that again. Can I go and do that again? It was a tough call, but after a night of hot debating, seven lucky children were chosen. One of those was 12-year-old Josephine Tipley. I'm here to tell you that you are going. <laughs> going to see these animals and helping them in the wild is just its going to be something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. I'm not sure how it'll turn out, but I love to make a big difference to help raising awareness and stuff. I live in Newcastle and I love swimming and marine mammals. I don't yet know where in the world I'll be going, but someone here does. Whoa! <laughs> I really, really don't mind. I'd love to go anywhere. I don't really want to go and see any sharks because I'm a bit iffy about sharks. I've been told to expect a message in a surprising way. Whoa, divers! <laughs> CBBC Saving Planet Earth is sending you to Malaysia to swim with turtles and sharks. Oh my god, how am I going to do that? <laughs> it's fantastic! I've travelled all the way to Sabah, Malaysia, which is 7,000 miles away from home. The seas here are full of life, including the two species I'm going to swim with, turtles and sharks. But this underwater paradise is under threat, not just from global warming, but from overfishing and pollution. It's taken more than 24 hours to get here and I'm absolutely shattered. Tomorrow, we're going to the fish market, and I'm really excited, although I don't look it because I'm absolutely shattered. Um, so I'm going to go and get some sleep. See you then. 70% of the planet is covered by seawater, and people who live on the coast rely on it for their food and their economy. The problem is that in some parts, some of the most popular species of fish are on the edge of extinction. with Terry, a marine life expert who had offered to be my guide. So, out of what we can see, um, how many of these are endangered? Um, so far, I've not seen any endangered uh, fish here in the market yet. The lack of endangered fish might go to show that there are just too few left to catch. Terry told me that over two million tons of fish are caught every year and sold to local people, restaurants and exported all over the world. Angel fish. Those are angel fish. Those are beautiful fish. Yeah, very, yeah. very pretty. Yeah, it's very sad. It's very sad. Yeah. There was a guy lifting a sailfish high above his head, and he was so proud of himself. And I guess it is a way of life for these people. But sometimes, maybe to have one life, maybe it means killing off another but sometimes some of those lives could have been spared. The hammerhead shark, all the fins have been taken off, and the head has also been chopped off. The head comes out this way. That's why it's called a hammerhead. Why has it been chopped off? Good question. 
some community here believes that certain community believes that certain part of the fish has some curing remedy to, to their to their body or when they are sick. And these are all superstitious beliefs. I always imagined all sharks were man eaters, but in fact the opposite is true. It's mankind that eats the sharks. Fifty-six percent of the world's population relies on fish as their main source of protein. But just because half of the world's population needs fish doesn't mean we should keep on fishing over and over and over again until there's going to be none left of most of these absolutely beautiful fish. If you take away the fish, you take away half the planet's food supply. But man's got to eat. Once they're gone, it's, they're gone forever. This isn't a pet shop. It's a restaurant, and these fish are all on the menu. The live fish trade is enormous, and fish are worth more alive than dead. This is another restaurant. These mouse grouper are rare. They've disappeared from many of the reefs. It was horrible. It really, really was horrible. I mean, there's... There's sharks in about six inches of water, and there's about 12 of them in one tank. And I just think that that's awful. I'm, I'm not eating here. I'm going to get some chips. I like chips. Yeah, I like chips. But it's not all bad news. Saba Parks and the Marine Conservation Society have been running an endangered fish release program and have some young fish who are about to move into an exciting new home. and I was invited along to help. I travelled to a protected reef in the beautiful Simpona Islands and met up with the man in charge, Irwan. What's this all about? Why are we releasing these guys? Uh, these are mouse grouper and they're endangered now. These species, uh, they haven't been here for about 10 years, so we are planning to put some of the babies back to the lagoons and hopefully in five years or ten years time we can see they are multiplying and many many of them living here. We're going to release the fish back into the lagoon one by one. Right. Would you like to help me? Definitely, yeah. yeah. All right, Jesse. You want to do it again? Yeah. Okay. incredible to be actually releasing them. This species hasn't been seen here since I was two years old. Come on. Come on. Yeah. This is fantastic. I brought my snorkeling gear to get an even closer look. Actually being in the water with them gave me a perfect view. Woohoo! How was it, Dorothy? Absolutely fantastic! They seem to know where they're going when we're so around and letting them go. They're picking their houses and the coral. This reef is part of a national park where no fishing is allowed. So these mouse groupers should be safe. But outside the park, it's a whole different story. The problem is overfishing. It's not just a problem here. It's a problem all over the world, everywhere. We look at our supermarkets and we see things like cod and haddock and we have fish and chips every Friday night. But now, Britain is overfishing cod and haddock. And basically, something needs to be done. It's not that we shouldn't eat fish, more that we shouldn't eat endangered fish. Terry called up to tell me that a shark fishing boat had just returned to a nearby village. And as I was keen to learn more about the whole shark fishing story, I arranged to meet him there. 
This is an example of a typical shark catch, and there are thousands of similar boats catching sharks across the world. How many are there? I think there's about 10 sharks in here. So what are they? Mm, that's a tiger shark, and the rest are grey reef sharks. And where will they go? What will happen to them? Um, the shark the fin will be cut off to be sold and make into shark fin soup. And the meat will be sold as a fish yeah. meat. So why is shark fin soup so special? Uh, it's a delicacy for most Chinese or Asian country. It's a sought after dish in major right. you know, functions. In some parts of the world, you can pay up to £100 for a single bowl of shark fin soup. I'm not a big fan of sharks. But this isn't nice at all. I mean, they're floating in blood. Right moon. They all seem proud of what they were doing. Can't get angry at them. It wasn't them. It's the people who buy it. If people don't buy it, then there's no need to kill it. People don't want it. They were asking why we were upset, saying that they did it every day. How can you? How can you? Some 70 million sharks are killed each year just to make soup. A soup that doesn't feed hunger, just a desire to impress your neighbours. I think the solution to this must be to control the overfishing. Terry wanted to take me to see a group of people whose ancestors had been living off the sea for centuries without harming it. The sea gypsies. The <laughs> <laughs> sea gypsies, or Bajau, live on small boats, but they've made some big cakes to welcome me. Thank you. Mm, that smells good. Mm. What's in it? It's made of rice flour and with a lot of sugar. Oh, good. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. How does it mm. taste? Sweet. Mm. Yeah, very sweet. Oh, very sweet too. It was great to meet other kids, including the chief's daughter, Monksy. Mm. How old is Monksy? Um, they don't know their age because they don't know when they are born. So how we gauge their age is by when they are a little bit older, they'll start wearing clothing. So we'll know the younger one don't wear any clothing. And the older one, and when they get to a certain age, they will start wearing clothing. Oh. So I, I guess she's probably about nine or 10 years old. Hello, come on, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> she just she said, want to go and play in the water. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Monksy was so at home on the boats and the sea. Before we started playing, we had a job to do. Collect the food for dinner. This sure beats going down to the supermarket. Good. Seems to be loads down there. So we'll definitely get some more. Different types of conches and sea urchins. They're all edible. Food collecting over, it was time to play. Back on the boat, dinner was being prepared. One of the 
things we can learn from these guys is that they only take what they need from the sea. It's great to see that we can eat all of this without upsetting the balance of the reef. And this is actually really delicious. So far, I'd only been snorkeling, but to see the most underwater, you need to go diving. And I'd been lucky enough to learn how to dive back in the UK, especially for this trip. And today was going to be my first sea dive. When I met up with instructor Ian, there was something I wanted to clear up first. any sharks? Not in this area, unfortunately. There's been too many of them getting fished out and things. But there is dives we're going to be doing later where you will see sharks. So, looking forward to this? Yeah. Okay, let's go diving. It was even better than I expected like swimming in a giant aquarium. It was like floating in space, just flying beautifully through the water. But suddenly we crossed a line. Beneath us, the reef had changed. The bright colours had gone, and instead the area had been devastated by something. It was a complete demolition site, really. Just like a steamroller runs straight through everything. I think this is what Ian had brought me here to see. This devastation made me feel really sad. When we got back to the boat, Ian explained that it had been caused by blast fishing. Fishermen go out with homemade bonds which they throw overboard. and the glass kills or stuns all the fish in the area. The bombers then collect the fish, but many are left on the seabed. And the blast itself destroys the fragile reef. I've read that it also affects fish further away as well. It does, it will affect fish in a, in a larger area. I mean, it, it kills, kills the fish close by, but the fish further away can be stunned and affected by it as well. And also a lot of the, uh, the small creatures that live in the coral and keep the corals growing, they get killed off and affected and they start to move away from the area. And if they're not there to look after the corals, then the corals start dying and so the fish don't have anywhere to live. But Ian had a real treat in store for me. There was a reef building program nearby and he had brought along some small corals for me to plant on the seabed. Destroyed reefs take over a century to grow back, and planting coral, although a small step, is a step in the right direction. And then, on the way back to the boat, as if it had been watching us planting the coral, an unexpected surprise. The best part was the amazing turtle. It was a green turtle and we got to swim along with it and we were like this close. It's really, really cool. That's one of my challenges ticked. Just the swimming with sharks left now. Turtle numbers are falling everywhere. It's estimated that just one in a thousand eggs laid will make it through to adulthood. But there's one spot in Sabah where the chances are much better. 
Selingen Island, a turtle reserve where they've been protected for more than 80 years, and Terry and I were on our way there. The sun was setting as we arrived, but it wasn't long before I saw signs that we'd come to the right place. What are these? Uh, these are tracks, turtle tracks. A female could have came up last night, all the way up there and could have laid her egg somewhere over the high water mark. Wow. Yeah. Are you excited to go and yeah. look for them tonight? Definitely. Just because turtles nested here last night was no guarantee that more would nest here again tonight. And we're only here for one night. We'd been told to stay off the beach, so we didn't scare away any turtles. I had to get some sleep, but I was too excited. It turned into a very long wait. Finally, the call came. No, I can't see the floor. It's all looking a bit green because we're using a special camera that won't disturb the turtles. It's a green turtle, just like the one I'd swum with earlier. She's got to lay again, you can see. So how many eggs are there? They normally lay about, um, between average about 80 to 160 eggs. Wow. Yeah. The eggs are collected as soon as they're laid. It's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. It's nothing I've ever I'm, no. ever seen before and probably never going to see again. <laughs> Something I'll remember forever. Then the eggs are transported immediately to the island's hatchery where they'll be safe from predators and from being trampled on by the many visitors to the island's beaches. The ranger and I is digging a hole in the, in, the, in the hatchery now because this is a protected area, so the eggs will be safe. In the eggs now. Yeah, it's going to put them in gently as if it's being laid by its mother. So, how long will it be before they hatch? In about 60 days. Right, so two yeah. months. Yeah, two months. Last year, half a million hatchlings were released here, and the females that grew to be adults will make their way back here to lay their eggs when they're old enough. I wonder if the turtle that I swam with was on her way here. Today, I'm off to Lankayan, where, I've been told, I will have the best chance of swimming with a shark. I'm still not sure how I feel about that. These reefs are in mint condition because they have a high-tech way of protecting them that Terry wanted to show me. This is a radar system that they have installed on the island to help them to monitor the waters around here. How does it do that? All these yellow dots here represent a solid object. It could be a boat. If the boat is heading closer to the island, they will activate their enforcement personnel and to go and see if they are doing any illegal fishing activity. So how many people have they caught? Last year, they caught about 20 boats. Uh, two of them were illegal fish bombers and uh, 18 are illegal fishing trawlers. Because of the radar, there is a lot less poaching here. We were heading out to where a leopard shark had been recently sighted. On the way, Ian reassured me that the shark would be a lot more scared of me than I would be of it. And I was actually looking forward to it now. Hopefully, this should be the place we've anywhere we can find a leopard shark. Cool. How big will it be? Ooh, about two, three metres long. Remember, they just swim away. Yeah. Looking forward to this? Yeah. OK, let's go. As soon as I got in, I could see why reefs are called the ocean's rainforests. It's so busy down here. told me that this is what all reefs could look like. It's so beautiful. It's a tragedy when it's destroyed. These are batfish, but I think they should be called Newcastle fish because of their black and white stripes. I 
I saw loads of these at the fish market. It's a porcupine fish. Seems like ages and ages ago that I started trying to record my video, send in, see if I could get in. Now, I wish I could go back and do it all again, because it just doesn't, don't really want it to end. And I even found Nemo. And then I spotted a shark straight ahead. It's not dangerous, but to me, this leopard shark is the most beautiful of all sharks. I can't believe I'm actually swimming after it. weeks ago, I was still panicking about coming here to swim with sharks. Being in there today has completely changed how I feel about that. That was awesome. It was mint. It was great. That was mintage. That was absolutely fantastic. There's nothing I'm going to be able to do that's going to compare with that. On this trip, I've had some highs and some lows, and I've learnt lessons that I'm never going to forget. And this has been a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and there's things I didn't know before that I'm going to take away with me that I'm going to keep forever.